Okay, welcome everybody to another MoTeC webinar. My name is Pete Swinney and today's subject is how to insert beacons in NetLi2. Uh, this presentation will be all about, um, just let some people in the door here, just to bear with me a second. So today's presentation is about how to insert beacons in I2, uh, effectively creating laps. The main reason we want beacons in the software is to create laps, and then once laps are created, you derive all sorts of information from within the software. So to topics for today is what is a beacon? So we'll explain what that means. If you're not familiar with circuit racing, it may not be a term that you understand. We'll show you how to manually insert a beacon into the software. So you can put a marker in the software, a very simple key to push, and that will begin to form a lap. Two beacons in the software forms a lap between the two. And yeah, you can, as I said, I said earlier, derive lots of information. There are methods in i2 software to allow you to auto insert beacons from GPS. So if you have a global positioning system on your data acquisition, whether it be ECU or DASH, you can have those beacons go in via information from that GPS. And we can have them go in by distance on a distance based uh, mode and, and we can insert them by simply typing in lap times. And if you get it all wrong, it would be useful to know obviously how to take them out. So we'll show you how to do that. And we've got uh, in I2 some drag racing specific beacon information. So for any drag racers watching this at any time, um, it some really good information about how to get accurate start beacons in for drag racing. That's uh, again very critical to get that accurate in that environment. So to start with what is a beacon? Effectively it's a marking point in the data and uh, it's a precise moment in time that we can take measurements from. Uh, traditionally a beacon uh, at a circuit race, uh, like a V8 supercar race, an F1 race, it took the form of a transmitter based on a pit wall and a receiver, a beacon receiver in the car. And as the car comes past the pit wall with the transmitter on it, uh, the receiver would receive a signal from the transmitter and a point would be marked in the data. Each time that happened, a lap could be created, and on the likes of our dashes, lap times can be displayed. Things like where you were ahead or behind your last lap. All sorts of, as I say, information can be derived from inserting beacons or recording beacons. Now, beacon behavior in I2 software is different depending on which project you're in. So I2 is divided into four styles of racing, circuit-based projects, so designed for likes of cars and, and things that, that traditionally go around some sort of circuit, maybe jet skis, anything going around and around in a similar pattern uh, in a continuous loop. Drag racing, that's whereby you would one start beacon and then in the drag project there's the ability to put in uh, your incremental time. So if you're in the drag industry, you would know that there's a 60 foot time, a uh, thousand foot time, uh, obviously an ET and elapsed time, things like that. So in the drag project, there's no lapse, there's just one run, and assuming that the customer would download the data after each run. In an engine project, you won't be able to install any beacons. You can't insert anything, you can't do anything with it because it's an engine project designed to be on a dyno, somewhere where there is no effective racing. A rally project allows you to install beacons and then rather than creating laps, it creates stages and every second what would be a lap on a circuit race is actually a touring stage. So you have a, a stage and then a touring stage and then an, another stage. So it splits it up. 
into terms that the customers are familiar with. And each sort of beacon and lap behavior is different depending on, on the project. So the certainly the most commonly used beacon, uh, additional beacon method that uh, I personally use and a lot of people use and is a very quick way of putting in a mark in the data is the manual insertion. And this is just a matter of simply placing the cursor at the point that you want the beacon to occur. Uh, you'll have to decide where that is and then hit uh, Shift F7 is the shortcut for it. Uh, if you can't remember that, because it's a data related uh, operation, you go to data up on the top line there and you'll go down and select insert beacon and you can see that we've placed the shortcut there so you can learn that. So it's very quick just to push shift F7 and then the beacon line turns up. Uh, you can put that in as many times as you like in the data. And in this example here, uh, this is a screen capture from I2, I can see that there's a test of, uh, I'm only seeing engine RPM, there's the channel name there, and we can see that this uh, particular engine has been idling at about 1500 RPM, there's obviously been a, uh, a rapid uh, throttle and the RPM has come straight up. It's actually data from a jet ski. So in this particular case, the customer would like to overlay two pieces of data uh, from some testing. So the best way to do that is to create a lap. The best way to create the lap is to insert a beacon at the beginning of the test and a beacon at the end of the test. So the next operation after this would be to move the cursor to where the green arrow is and then push Shift F7 again. And then this piece of test uh, data here would become a lap. All right, now that first moment you push the and install the very first beacon uh, on data where there are no beacons, the software automatically goes to what it calls the fastest lap, which at that moment in time is normally to the left of the beacon. So it'll appear a little strange and you'll see uh, you won't see what you expect to see, uh, but this is the software operating the way that uh, customers have asked for, and that's to go to the fastest lap. And in this moment in time, it's the out lap. Uh, so it's just a matter of pressing the shortcut F2, which is the expand data shortcut. Hopefully most of you have learned that by now. So anytime you're confused and you can't really understand the data that's in front of you, sometimes people over zoom uh, it's best just to push F2 and then all the data will turn up in front of you. That should look something like that. So in this case here, we have a series of tests uh, from this particular jet ski and the end result of the customer going and inserting a manual beacon at the beginning and end of each test has finished up with some laps created. Now, because this isn't a circuit race, this is some, simply some testing that we want to do some overlays later, you'll see that uh, our laps, we've got lap one, which is a test, then lap two is the time between the tests, lap three is our next test. Uh, we can see that the customer has turned the engine off at this point, made a change potentially, and then two more tests. So later on, we'll be able to go into the data and we'll select all the odd laps and be able to put them on top of one another, right? Because the even laps in this case are the, the turnaround times, the time that the customer has turned the ski in this case around, lined up for the next uh, bottle test. Okay. So as I said, once the laps are created and the webinar following at 12, today in the approximately 50 minutes will show you how to do this but a little hint of how to do it here is uh, that once the laps get created in the, um, the data box on the left hand side these laps will turn up here All right and then it's just a matter of clicking on each uh, lap and an overlay lap 
and then the two laps themselves will turn up one on top of the other here. And as a quick uh, example here of the previous data, we can see the RPM in this case overlaid, the throttle position overlaid, and the two speed traces. And we can see very quickly which, which speed trace is faster. Right, some other ways of uh, inserting beacons. We've got some data here now from a, a track actually in Australia here called Phillip Island. And the data has the speed and distance trace created by GPS. Now, GPS is quite a popular means of determining speed now. The technology is uh, advanced to the point where it's relatively accurate. And testing that we've conducted with our systems have found better than two hundredths of a second accuracy, uh, average accuracy, on lap times created using a GPS. So a lot of you potentially can use this form of doing your lap times now. And certainly marine-based craft, it's a major advantage to be able to do it. So in this case, we have some data here, but no laps have uh, been created. Now, if you have a dash, a GPS into a dash, you can actually program the dash, the longitude and latitude of where you want the beacon. Now, if you program that accurately, you will get the lap times turn up in the data. Now, if for some reason you haven't done that, or if you have one of our 100 series ECUs where you can put a GPS into that, uh, you will also end up with data without beacons inserted. So to do that, we there's a feature in i2, and you'll need the latest release only up on the website in the last uh, two to three months, I'd suggest, uh, to get to use this feature. But before we insert them into the data, we'd like to know where it is that the where would you like the beacon? Because uh, effectively, we're going to put the cursor at a point where we want the lap times to start and stop from. Best way to do that is to add a GPS track to I2 so that you can see where you've been. Uh, and that's just a matter of going to an empty page or an empty part of your page where it's grey. Right click and you will get presented with this menu to add a function or not a function, uh, one of these methods of viewing data. In this case here, we want a GPS track. We don't want a track position. We don't want a rainbow track. We don't want a track report. We want the raw, a raw GPS track. Now, you get that configured onto your screen, and then if you also configure some of your data, your speed trace, maybe your RPM trace, you can click through the data and you'll see the little cross moving to different points. Now in this case here, we've elected to make the beacon just after turn one. Uh, the reason I've actually done that is because the GPS ha has been out for the first part of the lap. And the moment at which it's come online again is around this time here. So I've just decided to get as many laps as possible and decided to make my lap start and stop from the small straight after what normally would turn one at Phillip Island. So I simply place the cursor at that point and then we move to the next uh, part of the exercise. At this point now with the cursor in the correct position, we'll go to Tools, Lap Editor, and enter into that screen. Now, here in Lap Editor, if you had configured your dash correctly, or if you had a proper beacon transmitter and receiver, you would see laps lined up here. Now, there are no laps. It's told you that there. And the way to get them in is to choose a method. Now, we have an auto insert method. And in this case, we're going to use GPS. So we click on that button and we'll get the next screen. As soon as we click on that button, the software brings up a screen that looks like this. And if you've left the cursor on the data at the right point, 
software automatically enters those longitude, uh, latitude and longitude numbers into the software. So uh, you check that that's right and then you push the execute button. Now you'll see an extra parameter here that you may need to adjust. What this means is this gives you a tolerance of 50 meters. Just think of it like 50 meters left or right um, from the longitude and latitude point. So for instance, if the track and maybe you're testing uh, on a bay with a boat, you can't necessarily guarantee that your time or your, sorry, your boat position is going to be in exactly the same spot each time. And it could be 20 meters to the left or 20 meters to the right, depending on who's in your way. Then you need to give it some margin of error. Uh, a, a way of thinking about how this works is the, the car or the boat goes around the track with this infinite line out to the left and right. And you get a margin of error to go left or right to pick up the that infinite beacon line that's moving beside you as long as it clips the longitude and latitude point within a tolerance of, in this case, 50 meters. So sometimes you may need to narrow this because the track itself doubles back on itself. So if the track comes back upon itself and comes within 50 meters of this point here, then you could have a problem. And now that I say that, let's go back to my uh, choice here. So this would be an example of maybe getting a double beacon trigger. So if we look at our point that I've chosen beacon there, and if the distance across this gap here was 50 meters, when the car came around and went in this direction here, it and this would distance here was less than 50 meters, potentially we could trigger another lap to happen. And that would happen in the data as well as if you programmed it program that into a dash. So in hindsight, probably not a good place to put it. On in reality, most uh, for this track anyway, and most tracks you would often have the start finish line somewhere along the main straight. So just to progress back. So we install the longitude and latitude of where we want our beacon to go via GPS and then the software will place those beacon markers and you end up with laps. So in this case, because we placed that beacon at a particular point, I've ended up with three laps uh, created from this particular data. Now, if you are at a track and you have a beacon transmitter and a receiver, and for some reason you end up missing a beacon. Now, we can tell by looking at this data that we have a missing lap, because here's lap one, and you can see how large it is. And we look at lap two, and the, I can see by looking at the data, it's twice as big as it should be. So in reality, lap two is missing a beacon. So we can actually use the insert, auto insert by distance feature, and that will bring up a small screen, and which will have already looked at lap one's distance, and allows you to manually change it if you like. But if you haven't changed it, uh, it, you can just press execute, and it will place a beacon in just based on the distance that lap one was. Now that's not necessarily dead accurate, but it allows you to quickly get your laps and do your, uh, analysis from there. Now, third me method that you can use if you have no beacons at all, and even if you have don't even have uh, a GPS, uh, a transmitter, receiver, any form of lap marking, still actually put your laps in. Now, the way that a lot of people will do this is they will get their lap times from the track. At a circuit track, uh, for a given outing, up and in Australia it's called Natsoft, you can actually look at your lap times for your car number for every practice and race session at certainly a recognised event. Once you have those times, 
you simply enter the start time in your data. So we can look through the data and see just at the moment the speed starts in this particular data. That must be the beginning of the, of the race. So we look down into the data and we can see that in the data this is at 11 minutes and 50 seconds. Make a note of that and we progress to the next stage. Here in our lap editor we push the insert button and normally when you first push that this screen here is empty. The first number we enter and you can see the format for it. This is how you enter the times. So we pushed 11 minutes 50 seconds 7.748 and then we look at our lap sheet and look what each of our lap times was from from the time sheet from the track. Now maybe maybe your friend has written it down on a piece of paper. Uh, however you obtain that information you can simply write those times in and then push OK and you will get those laps inserted all those beacons inserted in the data and that's what it'll look like. And that's re relatively accurate. Nothing will beat the accuracy of a dedicated uh, transmitter on a pit wall and receiver in a vehicle. Uh, the GPS is a very, very good close second and as I say within two hundredths of a second at average accuracy, often better than that. Okay, so maybe we've entered some of these lap times and you found that you've uh, bleary eyed on a Saturday night, uh, written down the lap times from the wrong car number. So you want to start again, the best way to do that is if you go again, go to the lap editor and simply highlight each lap and push remove. Individually out whichever ones are inaccurate and start again if you wish, a simple feature. Okay, for the drag racers, uh, we have a couple of really nice features here for inserting the start. One thing I can tell you about drag racing is that GPS technology is no good in this instance. Uh, GPS will have a certain amount of wander uh, when you're sitting there. So you could, sitting on a, the start line, uh, receive maybe up to 10 feet error on the start line and for drag racing to, uh, that those kind of incremental errors are, are not really acceptable. The first 60 feet of uh, drag racers pass is critical to them. It's um, something they study in great detail. So a GPS as a method of detecting the moment of movement of a drag car is a very good uh, way of doing it. So if we go into a drag project, we can see uh, some of the different methods that we can use. Now, we have two overall methods in a, in a drag project. The first one we've already covered, and that's our manual insertion, which is Shift F7. And if you've got the time to work through the data and get the exact moment that the car moves and manually click on it and move, place the cursor there, there's nothing wrong with this method. If you're under the pump and you've got to rebuild your engine in 40 minutes like the top fuel guys do, they want that data very quickly and we have an auto run method which there are two ways of creating this auto run. So again we're going into uh, under our data menu to choose which method that you're after. So if we're going for an auto run insert of the beacon, there are two methods as I said. The first one is the auto detect RPM channel. Now what that is actually referring to is your speed measurement channel. So it's going to be the revolution of either a rear wheel or a drive shaft and in most cases the drag industry detect the movement of the drive shaft because effectively once the drive shaft is moved you would assume barring some tire wind up that the vehicle is moving. Uh, so that's a simple method of detecting car movement although it, it is flawed and we'll talk about that shortly. 
So to set this up, the auto detect RPM channel, we need to choose the channel that the customer has used to measure drive shaft speed or wheel speed. So once you click on that option, you'll be presented with a channel to select. And you'll click on and look for the channel that you're using for your dry shaft or wheel speed. You can even use front wheel speed, but uh, certainly rail style cars usually lift the front wheel straight off the ground. So that's not normally a good method for a serious drag car. So our dry shaft channel in this particular case is called dry shaft speed. So we choose that channel and and place that in the uh, in the software and once that's done we push create and the software will look through the data let's go back to the data and actually look through the data for the first real we uh, real drive shaft movement so you can't quite see it here it's just hidden under the box there but this is the drive shaft speed trace and it automatically inserts the beacon at the first movement of the drive shaft. And that method certainly works fine, um, but is still not the most super accurate depending on the number of teeth in the drive shaft, but we'll, we'll come to that shortly. The second, oops, let me go ahead here. The second method that uh, is extremely accurate and it's only available in i2 pro is the edge detect method and what this allows the customer to do is create a maths channel that defines the start of the run now if the dry shaft for instance only has one tooth on it or two teeth on it and at the moment that the drag run starts the tooth has already just gone past so dry shaft has to actually rotate one full revolution before the data system will record a, a speed. The data system needs to time between two teeth. So if there are only two teeth on a dry shaft, then it, the dry shaft needs to turn uh, one full revolution. Now, in, again, in drag terms, that can mean quite a lot of distance has traveled or the beacon is inserted. So we can, using maths, define a start point on a drag car a little more accurately than just uh, the turning of the dry shaft. Now you'll see an example of some maths that I've written to, to define the start of this particular uh, drag car. I've simply selected the engine RPM travel uh, channel and stated that it needs to be greater than 4,000 revs also said that the throttle position needs to be greater than 40% and critically also the g-force channel needs to be less than negative 0.2 because the g in this particular car as it, you get pos, uh, acceleration the g is wide in such a way or calibrated that it goes negative which is probably not the way you'd normally do it however we've written this uh, condition that when all these things are true, this condition or maths uh, expression that I've written and I've named it uh, run start moment, this run start moment channel will become true when all of these channels here become true. So you have to create that maths first and then enter that into the software. Once that's done, we can then select that particular edge, which is the run start moment, as our trigger point for our beacon. So now we are going to edge detect method. We are not choosing the dry shaft speed anymore. We are going to choose and we type in our search bar run and then the only things or only channels that have run in them are air temp runner. We're not going to choose that. We're going to choose our run start moment. And I can see with a little icon next to that channel that it's a created channel. It's a channel that's had maths or been created by maths. So if I go OK to that, we end up with a, uh, an automatic beacon insertion. The shortcut to that, just while we're on that subject, up here is an icon. So if you, once you set that maths out and get that all dialed in, 
then every time you download data, you just push this button and you will get that beacon inserted. And that looks like this in the software. So if we zoom in on the start of a drag car here, see that the beacon or our run start moment method, which is the edge detect method, has gone in at this point. And if we look at uh, this point, it'll be above 4,000 revs. G trace will be less than 0.2, I think it was, or even 0.3. And our throttle position is certainly at full throttle. Now, the I've also included on this uh, trace here the drive shaft speed. So if you have a look, my drive shaft, my cursor that I have placed for the example, is sitting just before the drive shaft had started turning. And you can see the drive shaft speed is showing zero. So the drive shaft hasn't been recorded as moving yet. Now, as I said earlier, this isn't the fault of the data system. This is simply the fact that in order for you to record movement, you need to see two teeth. So, but clearly, looking at the G, the, the car at this point is pulling 1.9 G acceleration, so it's definitely moving. And the point at which it's actually started moving is probably even less back at this point here on the G. You have to be careful with noise that we don't get noise triggers for the start. So you could continue to refine your start condition so that you get to the point where you very, very accurately mark the point of the start of the, of the data. Now this seems a little uh, carried away, but it makes a massive difference to be able to overlay two passes of a drag car and see how fine adjustments to the clutch and fueling have made differences to how it accelerates away from the line. So accurate uh, moment of start in the data is very important. All right, and that concludes today's webinar on how to insert a beacon. This webinar will be up online within a couple of hours, so you, any of you can look at that further. And uh, obviously there are many other uh, online for you to view and, and look about our equipment. Now in about, looking at the time, in about half an hour we're going to do how to do overlays, which is a direct follow-on from this. And we, all, we won't be looking at data. We'll be looking at um, basically how to create the overlays so that you begin, can begin your data analysis.